And, um, and I'd like to introduce Jenny Rod, who's going to talk about maintaining your data quality when you can't see your participants. So take it away, Jenny. Hi, Joe. You hear and see me okay? All good. Thanks, Joe. Right. So I'm going to try and pull together a lot of the ideas that the other speakers have already covered um, in a very general way. So I'm not going to talk about the specifics of any of the many online experiments we've run. We've been running online experiments for about 10 years now. But I'm not going to talk about anything specific. I'm not going to give you any specific solutions to all the many problems you might have. What I'm going to try and do is pull all of this together in a general framework that you can apply to whatever tasks you're thinking of setting up online. So most of us were trained to run um, psychology experiments in a setting a bit like this. So a nice, clean, tidy, soundproof room where we have complete control over the kit. Um, we can sit side by side with our participant. We can check that they've understood the task at the beginning. We can debrief them at the end to see if they've had any reactions that we might not have anticipated. But things are changing. So we're taking people out of this clean, sanitized, controlled environment to a control, an environment where, for example, we have no idea what distractions might be going on um, as they're doing your experiment. There might be distractions in the room, they might be interrupted during their task, um, or they might be doing your task in a wildly inappropriately noisy and um, social environment that is not what you intended. And potentially what most worrying of all is that that 23 year old male undergraduate might be in somebody entirely different. So this is all a bit scary. Um, and I think my main message is just, well, we have to some extent, we have to accept the chaos. Um, I hear people talk about, well, I'm going to be really careful with my recruitment and I'm going to do this and I'm going to be, do that. And, and this will make sure that all my participants are doing what they're supposed to do. Well, yes, that's great. But to some extent, you're never going to avoid the possibility that the person at the other end of this internet connection who's doing your experiment is in some environment different to the, to the way you would like them to do your experiment. And you just have to kind of accept this, this brave new world of, of online testing. So in my view, there are three components to running a good online experiment. The first is clearly the tech. Now, Alex has talked a lot about this. Other speakers have talked about this. I'm not going to talk about it in any, in any great detail. But clearly, you have to have both software that is up to the task, but you also have to know enough about your participants' tech and your participants' browsers um, to know that you're, they're going to give you appropriate data. The second key component is recruitment. And again, there are other speakers who are going to focus on this today. Um, my current bee in the bonnet, my current bee in my bonnet is just please treat your participants with respect, recruit them um, through a platform ideally that is doing proper screening and pay them properly for their time. I'm getting really quite fed up of seeing people advertising their experiments on Twitter, expecting that something for nothing. If you want to do proper science with the proper experiments, treat your participants with the same respect that you would treat them in the lab. The other issue that I think we possibly don't think about enough, and I just want to flag up, is around the ethics of online recruitment, um, where you can't do a proper debrief, where you don't know what em emotional response your task might have had on somebody. And I think this is something that, as a field, we need to start paying a little bit more attention to. But what I really want to talk to you about today is, is, is data quality, what you do with the data itself that allows you to address these issues of chaos, the, the, the issues of, of the fact that you don't have complete control over the situation in which your data is being generated. So a five stage plan, I like plan, um, and this really focused around developing appropriate exclusion criteria, accepting that some people will do your experiment who shouldn't be doing your experiment, and how are you going to make sure you exclude their data? Now, please, I'm talking very specifically about excluding them from your data analysis. I'm not excluding them from being paid. Those are two very different decisions. My, my general plan tends to be quite liberal. I pay anybody who's had a half decent attempt at my experiment. If they've sat there for the half hour or so, they get paid. I then make a separate decision about whether to analyze their data and include it in the, the, the analysis of my task. So keep those two things completely separate and your ethics will have very clear guidance on, 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 the, on the payment issue, which is not what I'm talking about. Right, so the first thing I would do for any new task that you're thinking of putting online is just to do some brainstorming. What are you worried about? 
And in general, these worries about testing online fall into three categories. And so make sure you go through these three separate categories and think, how might this apply to my experiment? So the first category of concerns you might have around not seeing your participants is that they may not be who you say they are. But think about this in a very specific way. How does this matter for my experiment? So for example, I often care very much about the language background. I want to know that my participants are native speakers of British English because otherwise my stimuli aren't finely tuned to their language background. Um, normally for ethical reasons, I want to be relatively confident that I'm not testing people who are under 18. But think carefully, for your experiment, what do you actually care about in terms of participants' identity? This came up uh, in the very first talk today. People, if you're running, for example, memory experiments particularly, but also vocabulary tests, you might want to be, you might have worried around explicit cheating. So I might have participants doing a vocabulary test and looking things up online. Memory, they might be writing things down. So you might have a task where you're concerned that participants might explicitly cheat while doing your task. There are many tasks where it's not possible to cheat. If you're doing some kind of speed of reaction time judgment, you can't cheat. But think about for your specific experiment, is there the potential for cheating? And then the third area of concern is probably the one that gets the most thought and, and, and so on. And, and that's around um, attention. How do you make, sh are you gonna, are you worried that your participants might not attend? But there's different, try and be as specific as you can for your experiment. What is it that you're worried about? Are you worried about they may not attend to the details of your instructions? So they might not quite understand what you're asking them to do. Or are you worried about the fact that for the experiment as a whole, they might engage in a fairly superficial level of what we call good enough processing, where they're just kind of getting by but not really thinking very deeply. Or you're worried about variable responding, where they're sometimes paying attention and sometimes looking at cat pictures. So you need to think about exactly what is it that you're worried about when it comes to attention. Don't think, don't treat attention as one just general blob. Think about how this might manifest itself in your experiment. Have a, have a brainstorming session, discuss this with other people who've run similar tasks. What are the concerns you have for your specific experiment? And, and in particular, think about the reward structure. So a lot of times, if there is cheating, that's going to come about because you've built something into the reward structure. If your experiment is relatively well paid, you might have people lying about their back, language background, for example, to get access to a task that they're not actually eligible to complete. Once you're thought about your concerns, try and be really specific about what the outcome of that will be for your data or the inferences that you want to generate from your data. So what's the, what, what could happen in terms of um, if participants aren't who they say they are? So think about the worst case scenario. So if I'm comparing monolinguals to bilinguals, well, if they're not who they say they are, then my experimental contrast is completely destroyed. Again, if they're cheating, well, we might be looking at unusable or unpublishable data. For the attention, you need to think really carefully here. Is this just going to give you noisy data, which is something that's potentially manageable? Or are you talking about systematically biased data, where people are systematically doing something slightly different to what you really want them to be doing? And, and focus here on, on kind of worst case scenarios. You know, what, what's the worst? What's the worst thing that could happen if, if, if any of these are, are, are genuine problems during data collection? And then this is the key. This is the bit where you have power as the experimenter. And it's really the only thing you can do at this point is to design specific exclusion criteria. Now, most of the time, this will center around deciding which participants to exclude. But you might also have some exclusion criteria around individual trials. Um, particularly if you've got a very large data set and you don't want to throw out the whole participant, you might be able to be a bit selective in terms of which trials. But most times you're making broad decisions, which participants are you going to include, which participants are you going to exclude. And you need to build things into the design of your experiment. And you can't always do this after data's come in. You need to think ahead of time. What am I going to have to build into the design of my task? Do I need a speeded vocabulary test? Do I need to ask lots of repeated demographics questions in different ways at the beginning and the end to make sure I'm getting consistent responses to my questions? There are lots of solutions here, and all the different talks you're going to hear today will offer you different solutions, but you need something in there that's finely tuned to the things that you are most worried about. In general, the best 
guard you've got against cheating is to look very carefully at your response time patterns. So you're looking for predictable um, patterns of responding in reaction times, but also the outcomes. You know, what, so if you've got a working memory test, you might have a very clear idea of the distribution of, of, of performance as a function of trial type. And you can use that to spot people who are cheating and to say ahead of time, okay, this is what the data should look like. If anybody gives me data that doesn't look like that, they're going to be excluded. I don't have time to go through all the various devious, cunning solutions that people have come up for checking people's attention. Keep an eye out for these in the different talks. But don't feel like you can just take off the shelf things from other people's experiment. You need to think about your specific experiment and your specific concerns, particularly around instructions, I think. And to be honest, this is the point where you may decide to abandon your experiment. If you can't design specific exclusion criteria that you are confident will remove those participants whose data you don't want to be analyzing, this is the point where you give up. In my experience, the good news is that's pretty rare. But this is the point where you have to at least consider that as an option. OK, so you've thought about the worst case. You've designed your exclusion criteria. This is where you do your piloting. There are many reasons to pilot. I'm just focusing on the idea that you need your piloting to make sure your exclusion criteria are sufficient. So they're getting rid of all the people you want to get rid of. But they're also appropriate. You don't want to be over excluding. So if you're doing some kind of language task, you don't want to be chopping off a whole tail of your distribution that's informative. People who are low comprehenders, for example, or relatively low vocabulary scores. You don't want to be chopping off um, real valuable data by over enthusiastic exclusion criteria. And then this is something that came up in Emma's talk. I would, I can't emphasize it strongly enough. I would pre-register your exclusion criteria. Compared with a lab-based experiment, it is almost certain that you will be excluding more participants than you would do in the lab. And if you don't pre-register these um, criteria, the reasons for excluding people, you're going to end up looking like you might be cherry picking your data. Now, you might know you're not cherry picking your data, but remember you have to um, persuade other people. So pre-registering your criteria, it improves the quality of your experiment because it makes you take time to think about your exclusion criteria. And in my experience, if you do it before you collect data, you take your time and you do it properly. If you do it when you've got a lovely juicy data set that you want to analyze, you tend to rush through it. So by doing it ahead of time, you improve the quality of your science, but you also give your readers and your reviewers trust in your results. That this is that you've not been cherry picking the most splendid participants who conform to your predictions. You're, you're, you're selecting them on the basis of predefined data quality criteria, not do they give me the results I want criteria. We pre register on open science, but there's obviously lots of options out there. So to summarize, brainstorm, take time to think about all the things that could possibly go wrong and specify your worst case scenario for the ways, the delightful ways in which participants could muck up your experiment. Use these to come up with a set of rigorous exclusion criteria, and you may have a lot of these. Pilot them and pre-register them. And then the data arrives and you discover new and exciting forms of weirdness. And just to highlight the fact that pre-registration is not, it shouldn't, it isn't intended to restrict you. It is quite common for participants to come up with new and exciting ways of messing up your experiment that you hadn't foreseen. And it's fine to deviate from your pre-registration. If you're doing a sensible, logical reason for taking somebody out, as long as you're transparent and as long as you're confident that your readers will think that was a reasonable thing to do, that is totally fine. Just be clear and transparent about what you've done. People ask questions about checking data as it comes in. I do. I check data as it comes in. Not comparing conditions, not doing anything kind of sneaky peeking, deciding to pee hack, but checking the quality of your data very broadly. Are people taking about the right amount of time to do your experiment? Are people's accuracy about right? You don't want to collect 400 people's worth of data and then find out that they've not understood your tasks and you've got really low accuracy. So just keep really broad brush view on your data as it's coming in. And as Emma said, don't collect it all in one batch. That's just, it's bad for your stress levels and it's bad for your data quality. 
And then I would always include some kind of very open-ended question at the end. You know, did anything unexpected happen? Did anything weird happen? Is there anything you think we should know? And if nothing else, those can be helpful for refining exclusion criteria in the future. They might tell you something about that person's data that allows you to then go back and look at your data and say, well, actually, we should have excluded this person. What hints were there in their data that we didn't spot that we can use next time to make our experiment better? And this has come up, Joe, Joe, Joe Devlin's mentioned this already. None of this is actually specific to online experiments. This is stuff we should have been doing anyway. I think the, the increased worries about online testing in my optimistic days make me feel actually we're going to become better lab scientists when we're able to go back into the lab because I think all of this applies in the lab um, and we should be thinking more carefully about the data quality regardless of where it comes from. You do need to be able to persuade reviewers and editors and peers. It's a good news story. I found as long as you've got decent pre-registration in place, they tend to be pretty open-minded and I've not had problems getting online experiments through the review process. That's all I have to say, apart from a huge thanks to Becky Gilbert, who used to be a postdoc in my lab and has done lots of wonderful work and is now working for the MRCCBU doing lots of wonderful online experiments there. Thank you. Many thanks, Jenny. Excellent. That's, um, I love the framework. It's really nice, easy step-by-step -step to, to follow. And it's clearly experience driven. You know, you can see the, uh, the pain that you've gone through to get those lessons set up. We had a couple good questions come in on Slido and I just wanted to pass them on if I could. One is um, you mentioned that it's inappropriate not to pay participants, um, but they said, but funding isn't always so robust, right? Um, are there implications for providing incentives for making sure that people are doing it right? What are the ethics here? I think the ethics are exactly the same as they are in the lab. Um, there are situations where it's totally fine to not pay participants. Um, so I didn't have time to talk about that today. Um, so for example, if your ex experiment is super fun, super exciting, um, and they're going to do it because it's a game or it's going to tell them something interesting. So there've been some fun vocab tests where you get to find out how super clever you are and people will do it for the, the reward of being told something interesting about themselves or for the intrinsic reward of playing a fun game. And that's totally fine. There are also times where you've engaged with a particular community. So either through a connection with a school or people who have links with particularly cha particular charitable groups where you've got an ongoing community link and those people are doing this because they feel some kind of connection with you. And there've been some really good examples of public engagement of, in science events where people have used that as a way of collecting data. Um, I have the whole, I don't have money excuse. <clears throat> we, don't, we don't drag people in the lab and expect them to do our science for free. There's something wrong with the system if we can't if we can't pay our participants. Piloting is fine, but if this is data from a kind of classical experimental paradigm that you want to publish in a journal, you should pay your participants. I, 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 I'm happy to talk on, uh, offline to people in, or in Speaker's Corner to people having particular issues, but I, I, I do worry about this idea of, well, it's just a quick online experiment. They can do it for free. I'll ask them to do it on Twitter. Um, I just don't think that's proper science. I think we need to give our I think we need to give our field a bit more credibility and say, no, actually, this is proper science and we're going to do it properly. If my experiment is worth doing, it's worth running it properly. And we're saving massive amount of money by not having our research assistants and our PhD students and PIs or whatever sitting around waiting for participants to not show up. We're saying, saving massive amounts of, of researcher time um, to then try and skimp on the odd five here or there. And online experiments tend to work out much cheaper because you can run much shorter experiments. You can pay a couple of pounds here or there rather than having to pay them for the whole seven pounds to come in to do an hour's task. Okay, fantastic. I imagine that's uh, something that'll that'll come up in Speaker's Corner because people are really, sure. well, it's, it's, it's important and it's part of practical experimentation, really. Um, what I'd like to do now, if I could, is thank Jenny very, very much for a great talk.